Okay, starting. Okay, hi. So I'm Marcus, and I decided to go on a tour this morning. So I woke up five o'clock, and I'm really exhausted. That <laughs> trip up the mountain was, yeah. So we'll see. Anyways, um, uh, this is not as prepared as it looks <laughs> right now with the PowerPoint and everything. <laughs> I'm reusing PowerPoints, um, so I might fetch a few slides from two different PowerPoints, depending on what you guys want to talk the most about. And um, the idea here is that I wanted to talk a little bit about three different tools in the Oracle JDK. There's one called jcommand, which is a command line utility that you can use uh, to talk to locally run the processes. Yeah, so, excellent then. So, I'll talk a little bit about jcommand. I'm also going to be talking about um, Java Mesh Control. And depending on what you guys want to talk the most about, um, we can talk about uh, the JMX console, or JFAR, or some of the other tooling that you can download optionally and install into to Mesh Control. So, it's, this session is going to be a little bit up to you. <laughs> okay. So, uh, that doesn't really apply here, right? <laughs> so, um, overview, um, Mission Control really came about as a way for um, JRocket uh, to, to, well, for us to monitor how JRocket has been used in uh, production systems. So, <laughs> well, the initial reason was for us to become a some Java licensee because you needed to have uh, added value uh, when you build your JVM <laughs> implementation. And performance was not supposed to be an uh, added value, so we needed to come up with something else. And, you know, made the screenshot of a mock-up and said, yeah, but we have manageability of the JVM. <laughs> and they went, yeah, that's added value. Okay. But um, that was the management console. JFAR actually came uh, as, as a sort of tool for, for us to be able to see how, how JRoot was being used in production systems and for us to be able to tune the JVM for, for such workloads. Um, anyways, so we built it for our sake, and then customers came and said, you know, pretty please, can we <laughs> use this? Can we buy it? And, you know, being a startup with no money, it's like, oh, you want to buy something we make? Awesome. Uh, yeah, it's, let's, let's make this a product. So that's basically how it started. But it's for production use. It has remained, uh, remained one of the primary uh, primary key uh, things for us to, 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 to make sure that that actually works in production. So what it does is it helps you resolve problems faster, find bottlenecks in your applications, find bottlenecks in other people's applications, um, and to do a poor post-mortem uh, analysis, even if you do crash dump. So currently, with what is out there right now, you can't really, it, well, you can ask Oracle support to extract <laughs> the flight recording from crash time. In JDK9, you guys will also be able to extract um, JFR data from, from crash time. Okay, so um, it's focusing, uh, well, JFR especially is focusing on, on extremely low overhead. So we built this into the JVM, and it's being built by the people developing the JVM. So we achieve this by a lot of different means. One is that we have access to data that's already being collected by the runtime. It's already there, we can just submit it. And we have thread local native buffers, we use uh, timestamp counters in CPU architectures that we support for that. Um, and so we marry TC for timestamp very efficiently. We um, have very accurate um, method profiling, you can get method profiling data points or sample points even when you're not in a safe point. Um, and we have the best darn <laughs> allocation profiling I've seen so far. Um, yeah. So we don't undo scalarization for instance when we do allocation profiling. Well, I don't think that was good. Ah, did you? No, I think it was the floor map or something. Um, anyways, so uh, it's also safer and reliable to be using. Okay, I'm gonna. See, so I'm just gonna be sitting here. I can just put it on the table. Here we go. So um, it's safe and reliable to use in production. Um, we are testing. Uh, we're doing our uh, benchmarks and testing with JFR enabled. 
to make sure that we don't uh, introduce uh, any unduly um, performance regressions or, or that we don't don't uh, break anything when J4 is running. Um, yeah. So the overhead reliability, you can keep it always on, which means that you basically have a time machine. You can go back in time and see what actually led up to a problem. So if you can just leave it running from the, the go, and, and once something happens <coughs> that you can detect at a higher level, you know, depending on what you can detect, um, you can just dump the flight recorder in and then look at the data. Also, it provides very fast interaction with Oracle support. So if you send a flight recording to Oracle support, chances are they might be able to help you, uh, you know, just using that data and not having to get back to you. And if they need more data, at least you have a very good solid ground of basic data that you can... can, can just a question. Yeah. It's a commercial feature, right? So if I'm not a customer, <laughs> I can send a flight report. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay, so the question was, if I'm not a commercial uh, customer of Oracle, can I start sending uh, flight recordings to Oracle support? No. <laughs> Oracle support will not help you <laughs> if, if you're not an Oracle support customer. <laughs> It makes kind of sense. They, they might send me people. No. Yeah, right. No, so. Um, to help, right, to help sign a license contract. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, so if you're using it for development, you can just go ahead and use it as much as you want to. Um, it's, you know, it's only if you're using it in production that, that Oracle wants to have some money so that we can keep <laughs> developing job. <laughs> right? Okay, so there are two main tools in Mission Control. There is a JMX console that you can use to do whatever you normally do with the JMX console, plus a little bit extra. Uh, we have some metadata um, that allows us to, to uh, know the unit of measurement and um, some other things about attributes. So we can show you, for instance, figures in, in a much more meaningful way. Um, might demo that if people are interested in looking at the JMX console. Um, and then we have the Java flight recorder. And you can think of the flight recorder as a data flight recorder of a modern uh, aircraft. You know, you keep continuously recording things, and then if not something bad happens, you can go back and look what was actually going on in the, in the runtime of the airplane. But, yeah. OK. So. These are the supported platforms. We are not building the client for Solaris because there aren't that many people running <laughs> Solaris on the client. <laughs> so <laughs> we just, yeah. So, um, but we do it for the server. So all supported platforms, um, you, know. you can even run it. I didn't spell that out here. That's sad. Um, because you can use it on ARM. So on your Raspberry, you can do flight recordings if you want to. Um, which is actually kind of fun. Uh, <coughs> I built this autonomously uh, running robot. And uh, you know you get a lot of sensor data, and you have timing uh, constraints. And you can use the flight recorder to you know, see what's going on in there. So kind of fun. Anyways, um, <coughs> JMC installation and usage. Well, you download the JDK, and then you have the client. And you can also install it inside of Clips, uh, because you know, <laughs> we like to use all frameworks that are available <laughs> in the JDK. So we have <laughs> Visual VM using NetBeans, and we have Mission Control using Eclipse. You know, solidarity and everything. So um, you can install it in Eclipse and use it there if you want to. If you just want to run the standalone version, you can simply double click on JMC. It's in the bin folder of the JDK. And um, well, that's how we start. So JMX console, I think maybe I will just demo instead. So we can get out of PowerPoint. Um, so here is mission control running, but I'm running it in Eclipse. And the reason is that I want to easily be able to launch things from within here. Um, so run programs and whatnot. So why not do that? Let's run something that gives us a little bit of load. So it shows up here. Here's the JVM browser. You can see all the locally running JVMs or you know JVMs that you have someplace else if you wanted to. And you can just add them here, clicking on new 
connection, and uh, then we can either double click on the MB server or uh, right click and decide what tool we want to use. And then we have the management console running. And um, I'm not sure, is anybody here using JMX? Oh, gods. Okay, so maybe this is he's interested in it. <laughs> uh, okay, so yeah. You can monitor whatever attributes you want to. You can add you know, extra um, graphs if you want to. You can log things uh, into log files if you want to. There is an MB browser that accepts, um, I mean, you can do invoke operations even with things that aren't strictly, um, you know, simple data types. You can have arrays, um, so that might be useful to you guys. As you can see, we're presenting things in a more meaningful way than, you know, 62,400,400 nanoseconds, which might be what you would see in other consoles. Um, so we have that kind of metadata to know the physical quantity and unit of measurement for, for the different uh, attributes. certain things happen, so you can have application alerts, or log to file, or send emails, or you can contribute your own if you want to, if you want to have your own actions. They are very easily implemented. There is even a PDE plugin for, for Eclipse that basically just generates it for you. <laughs> you can just fill out what you want to have in it. <coughs> um, what else is there? Yeah, so allocation profiling, you can see you know, how much has been allocated by each thread in total. You can do deadlock detection, so you can see here that thread 3 is waiting on thread 4, thread 4 is waiting on thread 3. Um, CPU profile per thread, maybe you know, uh, it's better to use JFAR for profiling in general, so I'm just going to show that. Um, and also, uh, the diagnostic command. So, J command has a set of commands, and um, those are exposed post, uh, through an MB. So all those commands are going to be available through a JMX MB, and here we built a special tab so it's very easily, uh, you know, you can easily invoke them. But um, maybe we should do a detour. We're going to do a quick detour to J command, just so that you can see the command line utility for. For in the in this is 74 actually, uh, but most of the interesting commands uh, started coming in 7040. So if you just type JCMD, um, you're going to list all the locally running Java processes. And if you type JCMD and let's take uh, 3780 for example, and help you are going to see all the available diagnostic commands for that particular JVM process. So if you have a mix of um, JDK9, JDK7, JDK8, you will see different sets of commands for different JVMs. Um, usually we don't remove commands, but you will see more and more added, and maybe options added to other commands. Okay, so getting a thread dump is simply thread <coughs> print. And voila, thread dump. So maybe you might be interested in thread dumps, or maybe um, GC uh, class underscore histogram. These can be pretty large, so let's do it like that. And you can see how many instances there are per class on the heap. And the most interesting ones, from my point of view, is of course the ability to um, to control the flight recorder from JCMAN. So all the ones that start with JFR are ones that you can use to control the flight recorder. That was not a question, right? That was just you stretching. <laughs> yeah. So, um, anyway, so the JFR ones, I'm not going to 
show you those. I'm going to show some slides where you can see how you can use those. Some of them have a lot of options. So JFR start, for instance, if you do uh, help JFR start, you'll see that, yeah, you can do this <laughs> stuff there. Anyways, so that's jcommand. It's very useful. And if you have um, any ideas of things that you would like to, for jcommand to do, just send me suggestions. Um, we have um, some interesting ones. Native memory profiling here. Um, and some other things that might be interesting to you. But that's enough about jcommand. And that's enough of a detour. So I'm going to move on to what I think is probably the most useful of the tools which is the uh, flight recorder. So it's a high performance event recorder built into the Java runtime. Uh, it produces binary recordings. Back in the old days, in when we called it the JRocket runtime analyzer, it was XML, but that became intractable quickly <laughs> when we wanted to, to have some more uh, frequently occurring events, so to speak. Um, it produces chunks. And each of these chunks is self-contained and self-describing. That is, everything that you need to understand what is in there and to be able to parse it is in the chunk itself. So, you know, quite opposite log parsing. You change the log output, you change the parser. Uh, not with flight quarter, you know, it's self-described. Um, and also anything that you might, um, um, you know, constant pools, etc., uh, are also Everything you need to be able to resolve them are in that chunk. So every chunk you can parse and use by itself, which means that if you emitted a constant in the beginning of time and you record forever, and then you know at some point you go, yeah, you know, this looks, looks like a decent stack trace. Uh, constant one. <laughs> Let's look that up, and then you sift through the logs. That's not going to happen because again, everything is in every chunk. Okay, uh, flight recorder advantages, very detailed information, extremely low overhead, so we really want people to be able to, to enable it always, leave it on. And with JRocket it actually was, with the mission control client, we actually even start a flight recording uh, in the background. So the client is always recording itself, so whenever we have a, you know, something that support wants to look at, there is a flight recording, or at least the customer can dump the flight recording. Um, so the information is always going to be there. Um, again, the tooling for analyzing flight recordings is built into the Oracle JDK. If you want to do this in a distributed manner, um, you know, if you have a big cloud or something, uh, then you might want to look at other Oracle products higher up in the stack, like Enterprise Manager and Simmer. Um, we just this is a simple tool that is geared against uh, watching a single process, a very detailed. Um, so if you want to go you know, top to bottom, you might want to look at other toolings that give you that ability. OK, um, there is a Java API for using your own events uh, in the flight recorder, which can be sometimes you know, uh, a very good way to find hard to solve problems. So it's not supported. I have vlogged about how you can use these APIs. Um, and uh, it's very hard for me to be here today because everything that's been done for the you know, past one and a half years, I can't talk about. So, uh, but uh, yeah, <laughs> anyways, the future is awesome and very cool. <laughs> Um, yeah. Will there be official APIs, support APIs, that you can compile on OpenJS? I think, I think that is probably something that I can hopefully talk about and not get punched in the face for. So yes, there are going to be official APIs and there are going to be supported and they are going to be very efficient. Uh, so, did I lose my job now? Uh, <laughs> maybe. I might be for hire. Anyways, so, um, anyways, uh, it's going to be supported. Um, there are already 
third party producers for data uh, for the flight recorder. So if you're using JavaFX, for instance, and you do flight recording, you're going to see uh, pulse uh, information. So you will be able to see what actually took, took time in the different pulse spaces. If you're using WebLogic Server, you will be able to instrument and see uh, individual uh, SQL calls. You will see SQL statements. You will be able to see um, things like requests. Um, so, OK, so preparations. Um, before AQ40, you needed to do two things. Well, one thing, two parameters. So you need to add the unlock commercial features parameter, and you needed to add the flight recorder parameter, and then you're good to go. Um, in AQ40, it can actually be dynamically set up and enabled. So even if you haven't enabled it from start, you can enable it uh, either using J command. So there's a J command for unlocking the commercial features and for enabling the flight, flight recorder that you can use. And if you need to be able to do this remotely, you just use the normal sound management flags that you use for setting up the you know, normal JMX agent. And there are actually some JRocket features in the agent now, too. So you can actually use um, the same port for the RMI registry and the RMI server, so it's much easier, easier to, uh, to tunnel. <coughs> okay. Creating recordings, very easy and intuitive from the mission control. You just right click <coughs> again on one of the running JVMs and you say, hey, I want to start recording, and you're, I'm going to show you. It's very easy. You can also use it uh, with startup flags, which is very easy, well, useful if you want to start the recording every time you start up something and have it continuously running, and then dump this if something happens. Um, the documentation of these startup flags are in JDK documentation. <coughs> Here is an example of how you can start up a one minute recording 20 seconds after the JVM has been started. And uh, yeah, so the settings parameter, you can actually tweak what is being recorded, how frequently it, it is being recorded, uh, thresholds for you know, when to actually record the data, etc. So, yeah. And this is a horror and an abomination. Um, there is a special flag for um, a shorthand for starting continuous recording that you can also uh, use together with another flag for always dumping the flight recorded data <coughs> when the process exits. And we're going to fix this, but this is you know, how you do it today. It's awful, but you know, syntactically awful, but um, this is how you would do it. Okay, and J command. Here are some actual examples of how you would start recordings, check on what recordings are running, and dump recordings from the command line if you need. You need to. Okay, so I thought I'd show you what it looks like. Yeah, it's still running, so why not? So just double click there. Spell out what the recording, what what template you want to use, and all the templates that are in the JFR, um, so JRE JFR folder is going to be listed here. Um, so if you want to share a template or want to make sure that people within your organization is just using the templates you find useful, you can just put them there, uh, and those are the ones that are going to be enabled. So I'm going to use the standard profiling template, just record for a minute. Um, some high-level settings that you can use, or you can go into absolute detail and specify for each and every event type exactly what you want, want to use and how to record it and what thresholds to use. But um, yeah, I'm just going to use the standard one here. So I'm not, right now, I'm going to be running a one minute flight recording on this JVM that I started and looked at in the console. <coughs> and of course, J command, you can then use J command to take a peek at it. Um, it was, what was it? 2852. 2852, GFR, <laughs> check. And there you go, we have a flight recording running. And you could dump it from the command line if you want to, or, or do changes to the settings, or whatever we, we want to. 
Okay. Um, <coughs> so uh, I'm just gonna wait for this to finish so that we have something to look at. Any questions so far about this or the console or no? Commercial oh. feature part. <laughs> commercial <laughs> feature. Commercial oh, folks. <laughs> Can we wait for that? <laughs> so yeah. So this is what it looks like um, when you open the flight recording. You can see where you have the events and some basic data. This is going to change immensely. I mean, the visualization in JDK 9, I can say as much. Um, it's, it's, it's a very different piece, but it's uh, the same data. So let's open something fun instead. Let's see if I wanted to say something about the JFR store. No, I removed all, all those slides. <laughs> Good, let's just show you how it, uh, how it works. Okay, so I'm gonna open recording here. And the recording um, is of JVM that obviously had a lot to do. So you can see that the CPU load generated by the JVM is uh, you know, saturated. So we are bottoming out. And next step would probably be to look where we're actually spending time, or the JVM is actually spending time executing Java code. So we can see, you know, per package where we're spending the most time. We can see the list. We can see, uh, you know, from the leaves if we want to. But I'm just going to go to call tree and do top to bottom. And we can see here that we have this thread run, which is a worker run calling this count intersection method in the linked list contains. So calling, so calling linked list contains. So we probably don't want to change the implementation of linked list, even though even there are probably some committers here. So I guess you could, but might not help, will not help here. So I'm just going to open this count intersection method, which is ours. And we can see here that we are doing a lot of contains checks in this method. And what we have is two linked lists with unique elements that we do, you know, we try to find the intersection between these two linked lists. And that is, of course, very stupid. So we could make this much better performant. I mean, it's proportional to n. And, you know, we go through all the n, so it's basically n squared. We can do this better by just changing this to what? Better data type for this? Hashtag. Yes, <laughs> much better. So we switch to set, and we do const constant time lookups on, on average. OK, cool. So that's one thing you can do. You can do method profiling and see where we're spending the most time executing Java code. Um, another thing we can do with Flight Recorder is to look at the flip side of the coin. So latencies, thread source. Why is my <coughs> computer not <laughs> running my Java program? So we're not saturating the CPU. We built this fine, massively uh, parallelized application. You can see all these worker threads running around in parallel. We should be happy. We're not um, with the performance. So we want to find out you know, what's going on here. In this version of Mesh Control, the one that is out now, we would probably go to threads and look for contention. And here we go. There is some contention here um, on this lock. And we could look at the actual instances to see if there are several lock instances involved in this. But there's just one. And all these different threads are just blocking on this single lock instance. So Uh, I'm not exactly sure how the lock implementation is for those events, how the, the implementation for those events are. So I know you're just going to see inflated locks, and you're only going to see uh, where you actually block for a considerable period of time. Yeah. yeah. So. So, so. So the state becomes waiting on Yeah, you would. So you would only get events. I don't even think you would, even if you set the uh, threshold to zero. I think you would see actual re-entrance. You would, yeah. Um, 
Anyway, so um, uh, usually I think we have a threshold of um, 10 milliseconds or something by default. So you will only see locks uh, or blocks that take longer than, than, than 10, 10 milliseconds. So any, anytime you need to wait for more than 10 milliseconds to enter the monitor, uh, that's when you would get an event. If you want to change this, you can change it in the threshold, but beware, you are going to produce massive amounts of data <laughs> with certain applications. So, Anyways, um, we can open that method and see what's going on. In this case, it is, um, you know, we have the synchronized method. It is, and we're trying to, uh, we are actually using Fright Recorder here to, to, to log some events, and then we simulate that it might take a little while to log stuff <laughs> just for the sake of this demo. And we could fix this in various different ways, of course. And one of them, um, that is really good sometimes. It's been used at at least one large Japanese bank. Is to not log at that certain point. <laughs> um, so you know, <laughs> if the logging <laughs> turns out not to be critical, you might just choose not to. Anyways, other possible solutions might be to not have a synchronized keyword if you're not protecting something there. Of course, logging you probably you know end up synchronizing somewhere further down on a file somewhere or something. Um, or you could maybe hand a logger to each of the different threads. The default method is still in that class, so um, you can instantiate your own loggers for all the different threads, but again, probably synchronous in some, some other place. But let's look at how it looks when we fix this. So this is what looked before. We have all these uh, John and John locked events all over the place. Um, let's open up a... Recording where we, I don't remember which fix I did, but one of them probably going to look very similar no matter what. <coughs> and here we have before, and here we have e after. So, you know, we don't really have any, any synchronization problems here anymore. If we look at contention, there's nothing. Okay. So this is don't sleep with the synchronized blood. Sorry, what? Don't sleep with the synchronized blood. Don't sleep with the Okay. <laughs> Very funny. I'm too tired. <laughs> and it's your fault. <laughs> it's your fault. <laughs> but it was very funny. Ha. <laughs> you get a ha <laughs> after that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Anyways, so yeah, you can look at synchronization issues. You can al also look at other thread source that we look at is um, thread parks. Um, you can look at um, weights, sleeps. I mean, you really, I mean, you can see the sleeps here if you want to. To um, let's zoom in a bit. The sleeps that I'm using as a sort of um, way to simulate that things might take a little bit of time. Yeah, and also, I mean, if you're, you look at this, um, you can see that um, things are really just, ah, let's, let's do it like this. In this case, we're actually running things in sequential fashion. You can see the sleeps, the ones that are guarded by, by the synchronized block. You can see that they are never run in parallel, so we could probably have this single thread and I'd be quite happy. Okay, um, so, synchronization, how much time do I have? 17 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Could you that maybe? A question about your recordings. Yeah, um, it's 15 minutes, oh, we need to speed up this a bit. Yeah, I, I guess the, the recordings are streamed to memory whenever you go back and forth in the timeline. Okay, so it all depends on how you've uh, set up the recordings. Okay. So you can, um, all the thread local events are recorded to native thread local buffers, and then they are copied into a circular arrangement of global buffers. Uh, and you know, those keep overwriting themselves unless you've also asked them to be emitted to disk. So yeah, you can have that, a repo. That's, 
Yeah, yeah. So and if you load this disk file, is it streamed to memory? If you dump this uh, log file... Like uh, a, a, a 3 or 4 gigabyte recording? Yeah, so if you do it from within Mission Control, we're actually going to stream it as a byte stream to Mission Control, which is why you really shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't be asking for 4 gig of data from within the Mission Control client. That would be horrible. Uh, it's much better to... I mean, I'm not going to say that this is supported. Actually, I'm not going to mention this anyway. Sorry, <laughs> say anything. So we can talk later. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyways. Hmm. So, 15 minutes. What are we going to do? 15 minutes. Um, um, so hands, by the raise of hands, would you be interested in WLS integration um, to see how you know you can do a, a third-party produ producer could uh, produce events into flight recorder? How you could work with that kind of? Okay, yeah. So let's let's we can go back to to GC and JavaFX etc. If we have time. So this is. WebLogic Diagnostics Framework. Um, it's part of WebLogic. They are producing events for the flight recorder. And this is a recording from that. And we have a plugin for Mission Control, the WebLogic plugin. And here you can see things like you know, database calls. Uh, you can see <coughs> servlets being invoked. And the Mission Control client. And I'm sad to say that this is changing entirely <laughs> in the next release. But up until then, this is going to be used for information. So, um, for instance, if you wanted to find out, there's something called uh, the Enterprise Context ID, but you could have your own uh, relational key in your events. But in this case, case, we're going to use the Enterprise Context ID to be able to find all the events that are related to the invocation of this servlet. Okay? So, um, now I have selected, I'm not sure if it shows, probably not too well, but uh, we have a selection of, of events up here. And we can ask to see those in the log, for instance. So I'm going to like show me all the events in the world, and, but only the ones in the operative set. Here we go, we can see you know, what was happening during this uh, invocation of the servlet. We can see the servlet request running, we can see what enterprise job calls were made, we can see Transaction being started, or database calls, blah, 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 blah. J2E stuff that I don't know that much about. Anyways, so um, can also show this in a graph, yeah? In each relation, the key is applied because we have one event that has other events that are related to other events. Yeah, so relational keys um, is basically a URI by which you can connect different attributes from different um, uh, events. And the only thing we're using it for is for, for not overwhelming you with all attributes uh, that, that could be used. Uh, we're picking those first that are the relational ones. So in a sub-menu I did show you, uh, you can do grouping on other attributes uh, as well if you want to. But um, yeah, it's, it's mainly used by the UI to, 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 to make meaningful groupings. For, for instance, there are a lot of different uh, events about GC behavior uh, and GC ID is a relational key. So you can easily find all the events that were related to a certain GC by using the operative set, for instance. Actually, you don't even need to do that because there's a special GUI for, <laughs> for looking at GCs. But if you didn't have that GUI, you could use uh, the operative set for that. OK, so if we just wanted to see, I mean, there's going to be gazillions of events here and uh, various. Um, parts of this UI, but we just want to see everything that was related to our um, transaction there, our service URI uh, invocation. So I'm just going to show you know, what's in the operative set. And here we go, two threads were involved, and we can see you know, all the events that were related to that. Actually, even more fun, we could go back to the log and say, you know, yeah, this is all you know, high-level interesting stuff, but I really would like to see everything that was happening in the same thread during the same time that is concurrently with these high-level events. So I can do add concurrent, and voila, we see allocations in T-labs, we see method profile data, we see class loads, and we see all the very detailed information uh, about what was going on during this. And if we look at the graph now, we can see you know, where things were actually taking a bit of time doing class loading. Oh, yeah. So this was probably 
maybe the first time it was being invoked. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah, so. Yeah. Anyways, so you can get highly detailed information and using the operative set. You can sift it through all this. And I'm not going to have time to show you the other kinds of ways you can sift through things um, because I'm running out of time. So let's skip this and and um, wrap this up so I have some time for question. questions. Mm, actually, I have removed all other <laughs> slides <laughs> from this presentation, so... Um, nine minutes. Are we going to use nine minutes for questions? Maybe? Maybe not? Should I demo some? Oh, we'll use nine minutes for, for questions, so... so yeah. If I, implement, if I implement events in, into our system, can mm -hmm. we distribute them or do we need to pay yeah. for it as well? No, and so um, if you produce your own events, um, you can of course pr distribute the code that is using our APIs for producing events, but the actual recording of using the flight recorder to record the events, um, that of course you need to license. That is the thing that is that we are licensing, right? Okay. So if, but not if they are using it in development. Again, the same rules apply. So if your events are only used in by people, you know, in development, no problem. So you said it's going to change between versions. So is it going to be backwards compatible? So uh, we don't support using the old API for using events. Uh, it's never been supported. It entered the hotspot JDK, deprecated, and in the JRocket namespace. <laughs> so what it was. What about the future version? Then? So the future version um, is going to be supported and stable. Yeah. So that means for support for Java six, seven, eight, you would have to implement two the, the API two times, right? <laughs> uh, JRocket. Yeah. And well. So it depends. We haven't really we haven't really decided uh, in terms of uh, porting, backporting stuff. <laughs> we haven't decided how, how far to backport, and we'll see how, how big the interest is from people to use this. Um, it's definitely going to be there in JDK nine. Um, so so we can start playing with it, see see for yourselves. Um, so your licensing model is it the is it if Chris provides events, does Chris's company do the license, or is it no. his clients? No, the, the company that is using Flight Recorder to record. Yeah, so only when you are recording things in production is when you need to, to have a license. At any other time, you can just use the stuff. Nobody ever goes to production, right? <laughs> ha -ha. Well, you know, something <laughs> needs to finance <laughs> you know, the multi 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 million dollar effort that it is to build the JDK and the JVM. So yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? I'm really interested. I've just been hiding here behind my screen. Certainly we have this JX Okay then, um, so if there is anybody who wants to see some other of the de other demos or how you can do other things like, like looking at exceptions or GC details or you know the integration we have with Java FX or how you produce your own custom events using the old APIs, because that's the only thing I can show at this point. Um, you know, feel free to just... Uh, I'm interested in the current environment with uh, microservices, so but we at eventually at the moment we have around about a eight hundred of them. Yeah. So and on the scale to the scale we're supposed to be actually that uh, direct requirements it would be probably over over three thousand. Yeah. So also now put we probably will probably like to put aside the production environment. But actually how how would be what would be actually is the, the tool appropriate for such use case? How to monitor such? Such, okay, yeah. So the way you would monitor a massively distributed environment 
uh, and get flight recording when needing uh, get flight recordings when needed would actually be to use Enterprise Manager because it's integrated with uh, Mission Control and it can handle uh, thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of targets. Uh, so, uh, you know, that would be one way that you could do it. Um, um, there is other things coming that I can talk about. Services are deploy, uh, deployed in the cloud actually. Yeah. Are they going to uh, cloud communication goes? So goes from microservice yeah. to the Okay, so let me put it this way Oracle is betting heavily on the cloud, cloud. and uh, GFR is part of that bet. So that is one of the services that you will have if you're using the Oracle Java Cloud, which means that. You know, Oracle Java SC Cloud, I should say. Oracle naming is absolutely horrible. So the Java SE Cloud is what should obviously be called the Java Cloud. And we should maybe, or maybe we should have a Java SE Cloud and a Java EE Cloud. But what they are calling the Java Cloud is Oracle's Java EE Cloud. With WebLogic then? Web yes. But I, the naming is just, I. Well, it depends. I mean, the, the tools for doing, um, <laughs> yeah. So there is going to be tooling uh, yeah. that you can, can can buy around in whatever cloud, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and yeah. that 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 will do that. But mission control itself is not going to uh, uh, do um, differential analysis of flight recordings or or uh, aggregate uh, analysis of flight recordings. This tool would just show you one recording or one you know, part of a recording, depending on what you're looking at. In the next major version of Mission Control, after six, we are thinking of maybe doing, um, have, have some way for you to at least, if you have the files, do differential analysis and, and uh, for, for, for doing. Um, but we're not going to spend time implementing what is already being implemented in other parts of Oracle for doing this in a massively distributed environment. That makes no sense. What are the limitations of what data you can put in events? Oh, so the limitations of data to put. Well, it all depends. I mean, uh, if you are putting data that have massively long strings, for instance, you're going to run out of buffer pretty quickly. And then you're not going to have that much data to go back in time or either use immense amount of, uh, of data on your on, on disk uh, if they are frequent. Fortunately, most events that aren't from the JVM itself are very infrequent in JVM terms. They are happening like once in a blue moon. So starting a request that's like, <laughs> then eons went by <laughs> and then, <laughs> then the request ended. So it all co depends on what, what you compare with. But I would stay away from um, also from, in the, from, from a visualization standpoint, I would try to make the events as simple as possible and produce them as several events and stay away from doing complex data types even if you can. So for instance, VM flags are emitted as a stream of uh, singular VM event flags, uh, VM flag events. So you know, don't build these massive complex events. It's not going to help you in the end and you're not going to save as much space as you think. So. Oh, I think we are out of time, aren't we? One minute. Ah, yeah. So that gives me enough time to say thank you for <laughs> letting me present.